method to do a promise and project on voice. So if I do this, <laughs> Alright, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Lewis coroutines and how it's a secret sauce in uh, NMAP scripting. Uh, to begin, I'll talk about who I am, uh, Patrick Donnelly. Uh, I started out with Lua as a WoW add-on lurker on uh, Lua L. Uh, you may see me around sometimes. Uh, um, so I started out doing WoW add ons, but then I got more interested in Lua than WoW. So um, <laughs> I uh, started to dig into the language as an undergrad, and I had a lot of fun doing that, and I also found a few boxes for the um, and doing that actually was helpful because later on uh, I got an internship through Google Summer Code as a student um, with the NMAP project. Uh, you know, a lot of the, my work with Google was very helpful mm -hmm. in, uh, in getting that internship. Uh, that was back in 2008 and 2009. I uh, worked on the NMAP scripting engine doing various maintenance work on their infrastructure to make the scripts run uh, better. Uh, from 2010 to 2014, I mentored uh, students through the Google Summer Code as well. Um, mostly what they were doing was actually writing scripts um, and, and libraries for, for NMAP, where what I did before was just uh, mostly infrastructure work, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today, is, uh, is how NMAP scripting engine uh, works rather than what it does. Um, outside of Lua, um, I went to graduate school at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, got a PhD and now I work on the set process in the Red Hat. Not at all security or NMAP related, but um, you can talk, talk about that too if you want. Uh, outside of the talk. Alright, so enough about me. So, uh, what's NMAP? So, Probably a lot of people have seen or heard about NMAP before. It's a fairly well-known hacker tool. Um, it's also used a lot in movies. We actually have a web page on, on NMAP. You know, even uh, Theodore, the creator of NMAP, uh, talk about how uh, Trinity uses NMAP from, from the Matrix. She was using uh, an SSH um, attack on when she was blowing up the power plant. So, um, we love the full screenshots of that type of thing. <laughs> Alright, so NMAP's a massively parallel network reconnaissance tool. So uh, it's used uh, early on to just figure out whether a host has open ports. Um, is it running a web server? Is it running SSH? And being able to quickly do that for a large number of hosts in parallel. So if I want to see an entire local subnet and figure out which one which hosts are running. SSH, I can do that very easily, very quickly with NMAP. But the project grew and it's done more and more things. Um, so now the list is, is uh, fairly broad. We have NMAP can figure out which hosts are online. It's pretty basic. It's one of the ways we do that is it's listening on a very uh, com a common port. And if it answers, then yeah, that host is online. Um, then, of course, it's bread and butter. It's in this figure out which ports are actually open. Um, additionally, it also does uh, op operating system human frames. You can determine uh, is it running Ubuntu or is it running um, uh, RHEL. And then as uh, we also have it uh, figure out the number of layout and security. So whether or not certain ports are being filtered can give you ideas of what kind of firewall policies are in place, which can assist you later on if you're doing any kind of penetration testing or trying to break into the machine. So one of its more recent features, though, is the NMAP scripting engine. And it allows you to basically figure out anything you want about the host. Sort of the sky's the limit, you can do whatever you want. Uh, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So the NMAP scripting engine is a parallel network uh, script execution framework. So users write scripts. Um, submit them for our repository, include them, and um, 
and then I'm not scripting engine runs all these scripts in parallel against all these hosts, and they can do advanced reconnaissance tasks. Uh, things that are very uh, challenging or uh, takes too long to implement in C++, you can just write it in Lua, and um, bang out a script that does something in particular you want, and then you're done. So today, the NMAP scripting engine includes about a few hundred scripts and libraries. Um, I think the number is about 550, almost 600. Uh, and actually, a similar number of libraries, which is uh, pretty amazing. Um, they have HTTP libraries, uh, probably not often not. What else do we got? Uh, SSH, SMB, 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 SMB. Uh, Pretty, pretty much every network protocol we got some kind of library for it. Anything that's popular. Um, so NSC's been around for a while. It started out as a little summer of code project by then for uh, actually not 2008. That's when I started. So it must be 2007 or 2006. Uh, he worked on it as a little summer of code student as well. And uh, then I picked it up in 2008, 2009. All right. So uh, let's jump right into a script, give you an idea of how the scripting engine works. Um, this is an actual script that, that runs, it works. Um, it's a little bit dense because of uh, space on the slide. Uh, here we have um, two libraries we're including, HTTP, that's one of our, our main libraries. Every script must have a description and author, so we're getting a web page title and who, who, who wrote the script. Um, category is sort of a, a grouping or, or a label for all the scripts so that you can um, run run a number of scripts based off of some, some category that you like. So maybe I want to run only safe scripts, things that probably won't break the machine I'm running them against. Um, and then also they have a port rule, and this is saying should the script run against that host, the simplest port rule might be saying. Is that is uh, is this a HTTP port? Is it port eighty? Okay. If it is, then the script will, will execute the action function, which is just the script's main function. So this script's uh, pretty simple. It just does an HTTP GET request. Um, it gets the, oops, it looks up the um, a script argument for which URL it should uh, target, or by default, it just gets the, the root document, and then it parses our uh, there's a regular expression with pattern matching to get the title uh, and then returns it to the caller. And that gets printed out when we run an nmap, and you can see voila, we have the title. So, one of the cool things about this is we can run the script against hundreds or thousands or even millions of, of uh, web servers, and we can get all the titles for all those web servers. This is run massively parallel. You know, we can have dozens, hundreds of, of this instances of this script running concurrently, getting the, the, the titles from, from web pages. That's, of course, a very basic script. We have lots of more interesting uh, scripts available. So, how do we actually do this? Wow, that's not right. Seven minutes uh, <laughs> All right, so. Uh, each script is instantiated using uh, a coroutine, um, which tests the role function, and if it uh, passes, then it's going to execute the action function. So the, 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 the role function kind of became an anachronism as we went forward, uh, talking about features that are misfeatures. Today. <laughs> uh, really, the action function could have tested that to begin with, because we're always going to instantiate the, the coroutine to run run the action to the rule function and then following that the action. And the rule function falls in the protein just has to do it. So the NMAP scripting engine first resumes the, the, the HTTP title, and then in the HTTP library it's going to do uh, socket writes and socket reads. Anytime we have a blocking uh, network operation um, in, in our C++ NSOC library, it's going to yield the script back to the NMAP scripting engine, and the scripting engine runs something else while, that, while that's going on. So, um, 
a lot of what we talk about today is the challenges that we face actually actually setting this up. Uh, and it turns out we kind of have to build an operating system in order to do this. Um, so and the NSC has to actually maintain a scheduler for all the scripts it's going to run. And uh, this can be surprisingly complicated. Um, you know, we have to have our, our, our group of scripts that are waiting and our group of scripts that are pending to run. Um, and then the, the, the scripting engine has to maintain a bunch of infrastructure in order to query uh, what scripts are running and, and uh, uh, how to change or make an, uh, a thread that, that is now ready to be run. I should put that in the running queue. So uh, it turns out you have to, there's a, there's a lot of, um, and we're going to be talking about this more and more, uh, a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built is very similar to a kernel. Um, let's see. So again, the NSC is going to define mechanisms for libraries to use to build and restart scripts. In particular, this is used by our NSOC library to tell uh, yield to NSC saying that the script uh, needs to be run later, and then NSOC later needs uh, through event handling to be able to tell the in-match scripting engine that that script is now again ready to run. The majority of the code for the MS scripting engine is in uh, nscmain.lua, so we actually implemented most of the scripting engine in the world, which was uh, simplified um, uh, our code base a lot. Uh, this is you know, another one of those hallmarks of Lua being able to extend um, your C++ uh, uh, code uh, by just writing it in Lua and then doing most of that work there and then being able to bounce around between that and C++. Uh, so the actual work of limiting script parallelism and preventing, you know, if I start with a thousand scripts and they're all running simultaneously, um, you know, they're all going to get sockets, they're all going to do writes and reads, and that's going to slow down everything and nothing really is going to get done. Um, or the, the process will just crash because it can't allocate the file structure. So NSOC actually limits the script parallelism by limiting the number of active sockets. And this is actually done with max parallelism, flag to nmap. Uh, the NSOC maintains um, uh, a list of uh, a pool of, of available sockets, and if once that pool is exhausted, it just yields the script, um, and then waits uh, later on when that uh, socket becomes available, it'll actually be zoomed. <laughs> So the next challenge we'll talk about is uh, mutual exclusion. Um, this is sort of an interesting uh, topic and not something to expect to hear about with uh, Lua coroutines. Um, why, why on earth do we need mutual exclusion? There's no uh, mem memory synchronization problems. Uh, well, the first instance we actually um, encountered this was we had a Hulu script that uh, talks to the IANA servers gets the who is data for for the host it's, it's targeting. And then you know you can add that to your script output. It's just one more uh, thing to add to the um, aggregate output to, to look at. Uh, you don't have to run who is separately. Uh, the problem is, is that IANA doesn't like it if you have hundreds or thousands of scripts um, getting who is data at the same time. <laughs> who knew? So uh, what we, we decided one possible solution to this was we just add new text. So there's only one who is script that's ever that's going to be talking to the internet database at any given time. Um, and the way that looks in Lua code is uh, we have this library standard NSC and you just call this mutex text function, which actually returns a closure. The mutex text is associated with a given object. Internally, if that object is garbage collected, the mutex also becomes uh, garbage, uh, subject to garbage collection, so there's weak tables in the background. And so you have uh, several scripts that uh, do um, look up a mutex based off of a string. And then you can lock the mutex by calling the, lock, uh, calling the mutex closure with the lock argument um, or done. And then you can also try lock, which uh, no one actually uses. Um, 
So where our mutex is used, we, we use it in uh, who is obviously. Uh, another cool place we used it was uh, the HTTP cache gets. So if I have a HTTP cache, it doesn't make sense for multiple scripts to be asking for the same uh, root document, for example, uh, at the same time, just because they started up at the same time. So if uh, a thread is going to get, actually do the get, it's going to lock a mutex associated with that with that uh, resource, and everything else waits for that cache um, to be filled with, with the return from the get. Um, we also need to do it uh, for preventing concurrent SSL cert lock up, uh, lookups, and also caching those. And then we also use it for the HTTP slow, slow loris attack, which is particular puts particular strain on, on the pool of pens, uh, uh, NSOC's available sockets. So we only want to do one of those attacks at a given time. So yes, that's actually a script that attacks uh, a Solaris box. Sure. Yeah. For some of these use cases, could you just set max parallelism into one instead of using mutexes? Right. But yes, you could. But the uh, issue with that is you might, um, or you have uh, several scripts that, that you want to run additionally. And so you're basically saying, I only have this one script, but only one script you can run it at any given time. Um, mutexes are, are kind of, uh, one of the, talking today about, about uh, features and, and, and consequences after Roberto was talking, and you think that, you know, with mutexes, we actually, I often found that um, users see this and they're like, oh, I have, I have two threads doing the same thing, I need to lock it any time I use a table. So we actually get patch, patches, or, or scripts that are using mutexes and then trying to protect memory access by by different threads, by calling mutex before accessing the shared table, and then unlocking mutex. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the mutexes are, uh, uh, there is no memory synchronization problems. There's only one coroutine is ever running at any given time. But it, uh, the mutexes are there to protect um, network resources, for example, or to serialize access to, to some network resource. Um, but, you know, and that's in the documentation, but not everyone understands it, unfortunately. Okay, so another uh, challenge we've had is uh, multitasking scripts. Um, so one application we have is we, have, we want to have like an HTTP spider. Um, and it's really slow to just do a get, get, get um, serially against some web server. What would be nice is if we could do a bunch of parallel gets um, at, uh, at the same time. The issue is the NSOC library doesn't let a script have uh, non-blocking sockets by design. We don't want to introduce that kind of confusion. We like this, uh, the current situation where the, the, they call socket read and that blocks. You know, they don't have to think about sockets being uh, non-blocking. Um, so, one uh, option uh, we pursued was to allow uh, a, a script or a library to spawn multiple threads, new coroutines, which can perform work in parallel, working currently. Um, I reordered the slides, and I'm actually correct. <laughs> so, uh, one of the applications we use for um, uh, the, the HTTP spider is this HTTP chrono script, which um, the idea of it is we want to check how long it takes on average standard deviation for a given web page to load. Uh, and asking the user before running the script especially if it's just chosen on Mac that is part of some category, like HTTP, uh, it is not really useful. It should do something by default. And one of the things it does by default is it spiders a uh, certain number of resources from the web server and checks how long it takes to load. Uh, so this is one example script that actually uses um, an HTTP spider. Going back, the way this actually looks inside the script is uh, um, you know, I'm just getting a selection of this code out. Uh, 
It requires this HTTP spider library. It instantiates a crawler against um, that most important. It has a number of, uh, of pages. It, it gets a, a maximum of, and then after that, the spider just stops spidering the, the, the web server. Um, and then here it actually uh, calls the call, and then the, the HTTP spider goes off and, and, and does work, and then returns the the the, the, the page. And uh, the cool thing about this is, is that in the background, this library is creating new threads. It's, it's getting um, it's doing all of the networking, uh, fetching the websites, doing the gets, and you know this script doesn't have to think about any of that. It just uh, Calls the websites, gets the, the web pages. Going forward again. So internally, um, I, I I wrote up a, a quick little example to kind of highlight how this actually works. It's just grabbing code from the library is not very um, not very uh, good for viewers. So here's an example parallel get function um, using the HTTP library. So um, again, the idea of this, or the idea of this function is, we have a host, we have a port, and we have a, an array of URLs in a table, um, and we're going to spawn a number of threads that each are going to uh, actually do the HTTP get. So we have our thread main function do get, and it's going to actually run HTTP get. It takes an argument i. So it's going to get the IP URL stored in the IP responses. Um, we're going to actually instantiate that you get by calling this new thread function for each of these URLs. And then finally, we're going to return the responses. So there we're going to launch the concurrent thread. And notice there's no memory synchronization needed. I'm not doing any text loss. Does this work? No. <laughs> Why doesn't it work? Well, we need thread synchronization. Um, oh, really? Uh, yes. All right. So, how do we get uh, scripts to coordinate with each other? So, yes, I've created this this new thread, this HTTP chrono worker, and yeah, it's doing these, these socket um, socket work independently of me. But how do I know when it's done? Well, it turns out, yes, actually, we need condition variables too. And no, we can't pull because if we're pulling um, and we're just sitting there spinning, waiting for that thread to be done, that thread can't ever run. Because again, the code machine is only one that's running at a time. And of course, sleeping is not really a good solution because you know then you have these weird weights that are arbitrary in the link. So we have condition variables. Um, very similar style to mutexes. You can associate the con condition variable with an object, so multiple scripts can just uh, use the thread pool as uh, a table, or they can use a string just like mutexes to so create, create the condition variable. Then we can uh, wait on it, uh, signal, sleeper, wake up, or broadcast, wake up everybody. Uh, very similar to posits, uh, which is one of the basic installed upon. Um, fixed. So this is the fixed parallel HTTP get function. Yes, this one should work, but I didn't run it. So here we have our uh, condition variable. This is actually, if anyone does want to try it, it's in the, the scripting documentation from the MF book, which is actually open source. You can get it online. And there's a complete example that I do know works or should work as when I wrote it. Um, coming back to this, so we instantiate condition variable. Um, when the uh, thread is done doing the HTTP get, it calls signal. Um, here I can this is down, we're creating all these threads. And then now this uh, main thump, this main thread is going to wait repeatedly until all the threads are either dead or they actually created a response. And then I just remove it from the thread table. And we do that until there are no threads left. And then finally we return our responses. So that that works. 
Um, of course, something to improve about this is you probably want to use a worker pool. You don't want to just, you know, if I'm, if I'm a million URLs I'm going to get, I don't want to create a million coroutines. That's kind of silly. Uh, and then also there needs to be some wire checking, but exercise for the reader and all that. So another challenge we had with uh, and match scripting engine was uh, nested or the coroutine stacks, which is also been referred as, to as nested coroutines on the mailing list. Uh, the issue is that if I have a script that creates another coroutine, you know, because coroutines are cool and they're, they're applicable to a lot of different tasks, especially like for loop generators. Um, if that if there's a, a call to end, end the, the socket library, um, which yields the yield yielded value goes to the wrong coroutine. Um, so as an example, we have nmap scripting engine, coroutine resumes the HTTP spider. Um, the spider calls, for example, some uh, hypothetical straight function, which is going to do an HTTP get on that URL and then pull out new URLs to, uh, to get back to the caller. And so the scraper library actually does the http.get. Um, when the end stop actually does the yield, the yield will appear here in the URL. So the scraper is actually a, a, a wraps coroutine. So they'll get a, a yielded value from end stop uh, in the for loop, which is not what we want. Uh, we want the yield to always go back to the scripting engine. And so we need to jump across multiple coroutines. In order to do that, and the way we implement this is, um, unfortunately, we had to uh, re uh, hook all of the coroutine um, functions and add a tag uh, in, in order to um, so that scripts when they resume uh, a coroutine, um, if that resume resume coroutine yields. Uh, and the special value that NSOC always yields, then it just yields that coroutine too until we finally get back to the scripting engine. Um, and actually, NSOC calls this NSC yield function, which just wraps the Lua yield um, and actually pulls out the special value by calling this NSC yield function, which is stored in the registry. And gets this. Uh, this is actually just a table, and it yields that table uh, back. And then the, these functions actually detect um, that, the, that 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 value has been uh, yielded, and then it'll actually do, uh, yield that up to the scripting. So I don't expect everybody to understand that. But the point is, is we're tagging we're tagging the the yields, and we're detecting that. And then just pat, and then um, passing that up to the screen. Um, okay. So this is actually also discussed on the Lua in my city, and I brought that up earlier um, as another potential feature for the next Lua. Um, that we might have uh, tags in, in coroutines because this nested coroutine problem is not isolated to NSC. There's actually a, a problem we've seen in other places. And it would be desirable to be able to yield to the correct coroutine rather than always to the most recent one. So, who could have thought? Another uh, um, related issue is uh, being able to associate some resource, in particular uh, in, in, in a socket, with the thread that actually owns it. And we have this concept of the base thread because the actual um, coroutine that is running the socket methods may not actually be the, the, the script coroutine. So we want to be able to associate the acquiring of, say, a socket with that the coroutine that owns it. And this is, uh, otherwise we might have situations with deadlock um, because you might have, uh, uh, so 
back in the photo. This is the end sock. Not, I'm kind of lying to you when I say it has a pool of sockets. It also lets the script basically have as many sockets as it wants open, but there's only ever 10 scripts that can have sockets open. In practice, they only ever have one socket open. But we have an opportunity for deadlock because we have a script which actually allocates multiple um, sockets at the same time, and one of those fails. Uh, because or one of those blocks because the NSOC library can't give away another um, socket. So the NSOC library needs a way of determining who actually is the script that we're associating this, this socket's ownership with. And that way we can avoid this, this potential deadlock situation, um, which may, may just be academic. Um, so here's the uh, actual code for this. It's that this NSC base function we call uh, from NSOC, it wants to get the, the base thread for the running thread. So who's, which script is running right now? And every time in the main loop of, of the, the scripting engine, every time it's running a new coroutine, it just sets this current value, which is an up value to this, this function, and just returns returns that, that uh, thread. And so when we're acquiring um, a socket lock, which is a terrible name for this function. Um, oops. When we're acquiring the socket lock, we actually get the, the base thread, so we can associate all the sockets that open to the actual owner of the script. So, final challenge for today's talk uh, is we don't want to reinvent the wheel, we don't want to reinvent the network libraries. Um, so recently we added uh, support for SSH2 after three built rule summer codes. Yeah, it's finally in the map. Um, what the problem we encountered was we have SSH2, which is you know written well. Uh, it provides you, you have the option of doing a socket file scripter that's already been opened to use to actually open the SSH session. So this uh, this function, sort of the entry point, is session handshake, and we're giving a, a, a file descriptor, which this is really just an int. Um, and then SSH goes off and, and uh, connects, actually does the, the reads and writes and handshakes, and then you can run commands, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the issue is that because SSH is actually doing the reads and writes, we don't have the option of having it use our uh, asynchronous network um, networking library, NSOC. Um, so now we have this uh, rural library that's, that's doing these blocking operations, and, and we don't really have a way to do this asynchronously um, without re implementing NSOC and kind of meshing them together. Uh, and then uh, uh, turning on asynchronous, uh, non-blocking on that socket and then just dealing with that uh, concurrently with that socket. That's not really what we want to do. The other, the other naive solution is to just surrender and anytime we do anything with SSH, um, we, uh, we accept that it will block the, the entire NMAP process and no, no other networking work is done. And that kind of sucks because our, you know, the other networking, um, the other open connections, the other sockets will eventually fail or maybe time out if, for example, that SSH server is just um, not being responsive or, or has some um, uh, target that we trigger, whatever. Uh, so all the other network connections might die. So that's not really a solution. So, um, Here's what we uh, came up with um, to, to resolve this problem was uh, allocating a, a socket pair, uh, a unique socket pair, so two unique sockets that are connected to each other, um, and then passing that one of those uh, unique sockets to the SSH. Uh, and then, so every time SSH wants to talk to the uh, the remote host, it actually just is talking to this Unix socket. And if there's data um, available on the socket, then it reads it. If there isn't, then it, it um, because we've turned on blocking on the SSH session, it will say, 
Um, sorry, there's nothing built, so try again. So we're applying with SSH session handshake. It's going to to write to the first. Sorry, you can't read that on this slide. It's going to write to the first of the, the Unix sockets saying hello. You know, I want to connect. And then it's going to try to read a response back, and that fails because the Unix socket, there's nothing available to be read. So we get an error e again. Um, the SSH, the NSC's SSHQ library runs this filter function, which actually reads the data from the other Unix socket. It reads those 20 bytes that were written by the SSH library, and then it actually calls an NSOC write with those bytes, which is um, pretty cool because that might yield. We're doing this in C++. So we're actually using um, a little 5.2 feature where we can have yields across um, C and C++ um, where before you couldn't. So we, we actually are really excited about that. That was a new um, 5.2 feature. Uh, so this actually, in C++, we're calling socket write uh, with those um, 20 bytes. And this socket was uh, created in the session open function as well. I didn't show that. But we actually call nsoc create up here. And um, we're, we're going to call the write method on, on that socket. And that might yield. Um, finally, we're also going to then do a read on that socket uh, and get 40 bytes out of that, and then that might yield. And then finally, write that to our our, unit, our side of the unit socket, those 40 bytes. And then we can call the session handshake function again, and it will read those 40 bytes out of the um, out of the socket, uh, out of its unit you know, socket. We just keep doing this back and forth, back and forth. And so the, the NSC uh, SSH um, binding actually um, negotiates all the traffic on SSH's behalf for these, these Unix sockets and um, actually does the NSOC reads and writes so that we get all the parallelism or all the concurrency of, of the NSOC um, library even with our SSH, um, even with this SSH library. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, I don't know how I did on time, but in conclusion, coaches are awesome, and uh, <laughs> I'll take questions. Uh, maybe a stupid question, but uh, why not use real threads instead of Well, so that right. Um, well, threads aren't really something that plays nice with Lua. I mean, and, but also, and not for the Right. We could do that. But we don't. <laughs> NMAP already had an asynchronous network library, and it just, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, what's the word? Um, Violence the integrity of the of the length of of any map by conceptual integrity. Huh? Conceptual integrity. Yeah, conceptual integrity of the map. Everyone gonna start using that? <laughs> Um, so the question is, why not use Lua Wings or Lua Proc? Yeah. Um, well, with Lanes, we would still have, uh, I guess, the attractive point of that is you could have each script in a different Lua state, but we would still have the issue of of yielding, right? If we don't want to use real threads, so I don't know. It might make sandbox easier. Were you thinking something else? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other oh, questions? No, about, about that, for one thing, I think it's way more feasible to have like a humongous number of coaches than it is to have like the same number of threads mm -hmm. in, uh, in the operating system. But for, for the amount of 
the level of parallelism that NMAP does, and he was talking about like thousands and millions and things like that. You know, like, how much would it by the, the socket with the RG? What's the 50 So, the, we eventually encountered issues which is how creating a, a bunch of proteins for all the scripts because eventually we had so many scripts and so many hosts from them running against it, it got into millions and it was just unnecessarily yeah. slow. So, eventually, and I, I kind of talked about the, like there was a bullet point that I didn't talk about in the slides. We had a generator which we call whenever um, we don't have, say, a thousand proteins or 999, so we call the generator and try to get another one. And the generator is just going through all the scripts against all the hosts and instantiating the protein and then returning that protein. Um, so that's how we eventually uh, dealt with having too many threads, is we just have a generator which keeps returning threads to us if we have you know, more room to run. So it's about 1,000 running concurrently? I'm, I, I just pulled that number, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in practice, um, you know, we did test and we probably need to revisit this. Um, the, the default max parallelism, I think, is 20 or 10 in, in NSOC, and so it only ever lets 10 or 20 scripts uh, do network communications in, in, in parallel. Um, that's changeable, you know, we recommend changing it depending on what you're doing. But we found that it was a decent default. So you might have a thousand proteins, but you know, 980 of them are just sitting there waiting for a socket to be allocated to them. Okay. Have you had interest to use this in places other than that? Because you said you basically built the <coughs> OS. Uh, you know, this, these types of things are so specialized, it's difficult to apply elsewhere, so I, I don't really see it, it being applicable somewhere else, unfortunately. But in concepts, sure, but, um, you know, I think one of the cool things about this project is that we found that you actually do need these synchronization primitives that are often associated with just memory synchronization. You know, we did need them in this protein library. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in, a, in a similar coroutine and scheduling um, application, we might decide early on, okay, you know, they had to do it, you know, it's possible we might need to do it. Let's you know, keep that in mind or implement it immediately or whatever. Um, and not have to figure it out, you know, later on in version two that oh yeah, we can do that. Yeah? Comment for this. Uh, there is a library called CQ which basically has a similar system with only file descriptors, that kind of thing. The, um, there's actually a talk coming up, I think, about Lua HTTP, which runs on top of it. So you can use that as a standalone, similar version as the NSC. But that's what I was at that, so that's my talk tomorrow. Um, the idea of trying to prevent every application from rewriting all these libraries. We often see that every little application ends up writing their own HTTP library, their own, you know, whatever library, like what are my ambitions, sort of stop that representation and um, get some shared bases. So um, we should check that later. I, I, I think the, the problem we do with SSH could be applied to a, a, a nicer HTTP library, and you might be very interested in seeing that happen. Um, you know, as long as we as the socket pair, and then you know, we, we could do it. And, you know, that would save us a lot of pain. Because you know, we ended up writing you know, hundreds of patterns that were being matched in the HTTP library, and there's always bugs being found with that. Even parts of it are using help right now, um, which is great. But you know, again, we're calling the bugs, which are unnecessary. You know, everyone's using the same library. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. What's the library? Uh, that you've seen so I'm I'm really terrible on that. <laughs> I'm only interested in this part, right? Mostly, you know, I, I have mentored students, and we develop scripts, but you know, like I'm, I'm pretty bad at you know, the network or the network security aspect of it. Um, probably the coolest scripts to me are the ones that use a little in interesting ways. So like, I'm just a space fighter, I get really excited about. Um, 
I, I enjoy writing just cash because they want to use the testing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was that was cool, but um, sure. And then math is all going to be very different. So, but we don't have math at all. Any questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah.